Hey guys, my name is uh, Charlie. I'm one of the pastors here at Cross Seas and it is so good to uh, have you guys join us for our Sunday worship here today. You know, when this pandemic started, honestly, I thought that it would be over by August, maybe September. And now for a lot of us, we're just trying to figure out what's going to happen to our schools. Is it going to open? Is it going to be online? Is it going to be a hybrid system? I know that for a lot of us, we're so tired and things are just so shaky. But as we come to Sunday service, we ground ourselves on one of the things that is true, that will never change and is always faithful, and that is God and God Himself. So we hope and pray that as you join us here for our worship today, that you get to know the God who is trustworthy, everlasting, and unchanging. Well, with that being said, I want to turn you guys' attention to the uh, bulletin. So you guys can find the bulletin over in our YouTube description. Go ahead and click on that link and follow along as we go through some of these announcements together. First off, we want to welcome all of you newcomers here today. We are so thankful that you are here and we hope that this is a time where you are blessed and encouraged in this space and time. Especially if you're new, uh, I would love to get to know you. So my contact information is at the back of the bulletin. Love it if you would just drop a line and say hello and introduce yourself. And so we could give you more updates about our ministry and all the things that we're doing in this time. Next is we have a check-in system. And so the check-in system is our opportunity to see who came to our service and who didn't and to follow up with those who did, may or may not have come. And so I want to give you guys this time right now to go ahead and click the link in the bulletin to go ahead and find yourself to that Google form where you'll just say that you're here just by filling out your name and the date that today is, the 19th, I believe. So. Go ahead and fill that one out and yeah, as I give you guys some time to do that, why don't you share in the comment section, what is your favorite childhood memory and why? So as people are writing down some stuff, and checking in, hope that some of you guys shared your favorite childhood memory. All right, well, I suppose, wow, those look like great childhood memories. This is Charlie from the future saying that, but we'll go ahead and go along and share some of the other announcements. We have, uh, for the seventh graders, we have Sunday seventh grade fellowship time after the service. And Sunday fellowship is a time just where we get to hang out with one another, play some games to get to know one another, and then share some prayer requests. So this is our opportunity to try to get to know you guys. So please come on out. The Zoom link is in the description below. So hope to see you there. Next thing is they were starting summer clubs this week. Summer clubs is our opportunity to learn something new, hang out, as well as get to know one another throughout the week. And we have all these different interesting ways that we could uh, spend time with one another. You guys could do fitness with me tomorrow. Uh, you guys could learn how to bake, uh, meal prep. There is uh, there's singing, there's League of Legends, there's Minecraft. There's a lot of different ways to stay busy and so we hope that you guys would join us for that. You guys could sign up even today so please go ahead and click the link and sign up as you may. Next announcement is Sunday night prayer meeting. We have Sunday night prayer every Sunday from 7 to 8 p.m. We're so encouraged by Joshua Kim, 7th grader, joined us for prayer meeting and yeah we are looking for any, any person that wants to pray. Everyone is obviously welcomed. And this is a great time for us to turn our attention to the Lord and plead with Him for all the different things that are going on in our lives. So we hope that you guys would join us and that it would be a blessed time together. Next is we have Thursday Youth Night going on. And Thursday Youth Night is just a night that we get to hang out, play some games, get to know one another. And so join us for Thursday Youth Night from 7 to 8 p.m. Hope to see you guys there. Well. As we uh, transition now into our worship, we're going to start our worship with what's called the call to worship. The call to worship reminds us that worship is all about hearing from God, spending time with Him, and building up our lives upon Him. And so as we start our service, we don't need to warm up. We want to tell you guys what you're going to get from the beginning. We're here to see and to know God. And so our call to worship does that. And so if you guys could look at your screen, we'll be reading from Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. I'll be reading the leader portion and let's all read the uh, all together portion together. This is the reading of God's word from Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. 
all together ready begin and the Lord has laid on him he the iniquity of us all amen as we come to God in prayer let us come to him in thankfulness and gratitude that even though we sinned and turned away from him in Jesus Christ he has paid our debt and has made our worship acceptable to our holy God let's come to God in prayer at this time let's pray created one, the author of salvation, wrote the laws of space and time, and fashioned worlds to his design. The one who made Jehoshaphat Hung the stars like chandeliers Numbered every grain of sand Knows the heart of every man He is king forever He is king forever He is king forevermore Fortress and our strength, the rock on which we can depend, matchless in his majesty, his power and authority, unshaken by the schemes of men. Never changing, great I am Kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall He is faithful through it all Crown Him King forever Crown Him King forever Crown Him King forevermore God in mortal flesh Forsaken by a traitor's kiss The curse of sin and centuries Did pierce the lowly prince of peace Oh, lifted high the sinless man Crucify the spotless lamb Buried by the sons of man But he was rescued by the Father's hand To reign as King forever Reign as King forever Reign as King forevermore O God of grace, we crown you with the highest praise. Heaven shouts and saints adore your holy, holy, holy Lord. What joy in everlasting life when all is love and faith is sight. Justice rolls and praises rise At the name of Jesus Christ The King of kings forever King of kings forever King of kings forevermore You're the King of kings forever King of kings forever King of kings forevermore. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we worship you.
because of what you've done for us by sending Christ to come and save us. Lord, we give you our worship and we give you our praise because, Lord, you are worthy. And so, God, we pray that now as we sing these songs, Lord, would you help us to have a posture of worship, a posture of humility before you, acknowledging our need for you and your worthiness, God. And so, Lord, we pray that you would be glorified through our singing. Would you be pleased, Lord, and honored? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this next song that we'll be singing is a relatively new song. I think for our new students, our sixth graders and seventh graders, this is actually a VBS song. Um, But it's also an old hymn. And so for those of us who are not familiar with this song, let's try to follow it as closely as possible. It's called The Old Rookie Cross. Let's sing it now. And on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain so i'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last i'll lay down And I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown No, the old rugged cross So despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me for the dear lamb of god left his glory above to bear it to dark calvary so i'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last i lay down and i will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown and the old rugged cross stained with blood so divine a wondrous beauty i see For on that old cross Jesus suffered and died To pardon and sanctify me And so I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down And I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown 
To the old rugged cross Will ever be true It's shame and reproach Gladly bear Then he'll call me someday To my home far away Where is glory forever I'll share I was an orphan lost at the fall Running away when I'd hear you call Father, you worked your will I had no righteousness of my own I had no right to drown in your throne But Father, you loved me still and in love before where you lay the world's foundation You predestined to adopt me as your own You have raised me up so high above my station I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone you left your home to seek out the lost You knew the great and terrible cost Jesus, your face was set And I worked my fingers down to the bone Nothing I did could ever atone But Jesus, you paid my debt and by your blood I have redemption and salvation Lord, you die that I might reap what you have sown And you rose that I might be a new creation I am born again by grace and grace alone I was in darkness all of my life I never knew the day from the night But Spirit, you made me see I swore I knew the way on my own A head full of rocks, a heart made of stone But Spirit, you moved in me and at your touch my sleeping spirit was awakened And on my darkened heart the light of Christ has shone I called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken Heaven said to sin by grace and grace alone so I'll stand in faith by grace and grace alone I will run the race by grace and grace alone And I will slay my sin by grace, grace alone And I will reach the end by grace and grace alone oh. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are fully dependent on your grace alone. God, it's by your grace that you have restored us to yourself by loving us first, by sending Christ to come and die for us, and by giving us the Holy Spirit to run this race. God, we pray that you would give us the faith to obey you, to listen to you, to follow you, Lord. And God, would the Holy Spirit sustain us now as we f obey your word, God. We pray that you would be honored um, through our obedience. And God, we pray for our time of uh, sermon preaching. Lord, would you help us to be attentive and help us to listen to your word. 
God, would you reveal yourself to us today? We thank you so much, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good products provide good solutions to problems, like this one. Hey, tired of not having enough closet space? If you get one of these hangers, then you just quadruple the size of your closet. Hey, tired of spending your mornings looking for that AirPod that fell out while you were sleeping? Well, if you put on this Bluetooth headband, you will never have that problem ever again. And if you, follow, if you end up losing this Bluetooth headband when you sleep, you should probably consult a doctor. Or hey, you wanna be a good Asian and you wanna make sure you get all of your money's worth from that toothpaste? Hey, buy this toothpaste clip. It practically pays for itself with all the extra brushes that you'll be getting in. Now, what makes these good products? It's because they provide good solutions to problems that we have. And that is what makes these products desirable to you and me. But let's shift gears a bit. And let me ask you, is Christianity desirable to you? Do you see how Christianity provides a solution to a huge problem that you and I have? Many of us watching may not care or take our beliefs very seriously because we don't understand the great problem we faced. And if we don't understand the problem, we will never see how Christianity provides the only solution. If we don't understand the problem, we're never going to be able to see that Christianity provides the only solution. Now, what is the problem? And what is the solution that Christianity provides? Well, those will be the two headings of our sermon here today. We're going to look at the problem we face and the solution we find in Christianity. And so if you have your Bibles with me, please turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Give you guys some time to turn there. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Hear now the reading of God's word. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Amen. Thus ends the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. May he write his eternal truth upon our hearts here today. The problem that we face, as we see in verse 1, is that we were dead. Man, that's a pretty big problem to have. But the text is not talking to us about physical death, but rather a spiritual one. But what does it mean for us to be spiritually dead? Being spiritually dead simply means that you are separated from God and you and I are helpless to bridge that gap between you and me and God himself. Genesis 2 and 3 shares to us what spiritual death looks like. Those chapters are about Adam and Eve who God warns that if they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil inside of the Garden of Eden, that they would surely die. But do you notice as you read that story from Genesis 2 and 3, that once they take a bite of that fruit, that they don't die. They're not physically dead. Well, what is dead? Well, the truth of that is that they are spiritually dead. Their relationship with God died. And so what happens after they eat the fruit? They get kicked out of the garden, away from the presence of God, and the way back to the garden was blocked off by an angel with a flaming sword. Adam and Eve were utterly helpless to return back to the presence of God themselves. This is what spiritual death means. Spiritual death means that you and I share the same fate as Adam and Eve, apart from the presence of God and completely helpless to restore that relationship ourselves. But why? Why were we spiritually dead? Because of the same reason as Adam and Eve. It says in verse 1 why you and I are spiritually dead. We are dead because of the trespasses and sins that we have done. We had done wrong and moved away from God and thus deserve to be spiritually dead. Now for some of us listening in, that might feel too severe for some of us. Wow, the spiritual death penalty over sin? Why would God take sin so seriously? Why is God so severe? And the reason is this, because of what sin is. Sin 
by its definition, is replacing God with something or someone else. Sin, by its very nature, is taking God from his rightful place and choosing something or someone else to take his place. And as we read verses 2 and 3, we see what we choose to replace God with and what makes sin so offensive to him. Look down with me at verses 2 to 3 together. It says this, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying or following the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. We see two things that we chose to replace God with. Number one, we have chosen to replace God with the world. Verse 2 says that we have followed the course of this world. Now, what does that mean that we become worldly and choose to replace God with the world? It means this, we have allowed what's popular to determine what's right and wrong for us. It's when we have the world's values rather than God's values. We don't desire to be holy like God. We would rather desire to fit in just like everyone else. We don't desire and long for God's acceptance, God's love, God's happiness, but rather we would have the acceptance of the world. We long for the things that the world can give to us. And in so doing, we, we replace God with the world because we want the things that the world can offer, right? We want popularity, acceptance, we want power, we want freedom. And when we desire those things over God, over a meaningful relationship with God. We have so replaced God in our lives with the world. You might be thinking to yourself, well, that doesn't seem so bad. It seems okay. That seems like what everyone else has been doing, striving for acceptance, power, freedom, prestige. That seems just like the normal course of everyday life. And we see what the world does to us. This world dangles all of these different things that it could give to us, money, power, achievement, wealth, fame. And it dangles its treasures before us and hoping just like a fish that we would bite some of the things that is offered. But what is hidden behind those promises, those treasures that the world offers is a hook, a hook that is meant to take you away from God and lead you to your own destruction. In the same way bait is used by a fisherman to catch fish, so too the world dangles all of these different things that we treasure and want only so that we would forsake God, leave Him, and that we would end up destroying ourselves. We have to ask ourselves, man, that's pretty bleak and that's pretty sad. Who would be the fisherman in this illustration? Who would be the one who would want us to take us away from God and lead us to our destruction? Well, if you look down with me at verse 2, it tells us who is behind our desires and pleasures for the world. It is the prince of the power of the air who is simply Satan himself. Satan desires to take you from God and lead you to your own destruction. He is behind the false promises of the world and he loves it, loves it when you decide to replace God with something else. You see what a serious offense it is to God when we choose to replace God with the world. That is what happens to us. But it's not just the things outside of us. It's not the world that's the problem only. It's also the things that are inside of us. Because if you were to look at verse 3, it tells us that we have wrong stuff inside of us. Verse 3 tells us that we carry out the desires of the body and the mind. Rather than following God, we actively choose to replace God in our lives by putting ourselves in His place. Whenever we think our greatest value in our lives is our own personal happiness, we are replacing God with ourselves. Or when we think that you and I can determine what's right or wrong, we are replacing God with 
ourselves or when we think that our actions are only for us and they should bear no consequences on anyone or anything we have replaced God with ourselves we have taken God's place as king ruler and judge of this world and placed ourselves in its place when we choose to do what our minds and hearts desire rather than God now what makes spiritual death so dangerous is that we replace God with the world and its treasures or we replace God with ourselves but what is the biblical definition when you replace God with something else the biblical answer is that that is a form of idolatry idolatry by its definition is replacing God and worshiping something or someone else as you read the Bible you will see that God takes idolatry very seriously it deserved the death penalty so are we so shocked that in our idolatry in following the world or following our feelings and ourselves that we deserve spiritual death because we have chosen those things over God you see because of our desires to replace God we are completely separated from our relationship with God utterly helpless to save ourselves and mend that relationship on our own that is quite the problem that you and I have that is quite the mess and so what could be done so that we would be helped how can we somehow restore our relationship with God well other religions will come and believe that hey you and I are not so bad the mess isn't that messy they believe that you just need to figure it out yourself that you're not spiritually dead what you need to do is you need to love the world less you need to love God more you need to do more religious good things you need to stay away from doing bad things and in your heart just try to do your best in being a good person other religions are summarizing saying that that is the way to restore your relationship with God just try hard do good be good and don't do these things but do you see why that doesn't necessarily solve our problem here today that doing good things will not work if this truly is our spiritual condition why because what is the point of doing good things when you are dead you're dead that simply means that you are completely helpless other religions will teach you and tell you hey you have to walk but they won't give you the legs to do it you and I are totally incapable of saving ourselves by our own works, our own efforts, our own sincerity, because you and I are spiritually dead. We are completely separated. We are completely helpless. And none of us can make ourselves spiritually alive no matter how hard we try no matter how sincere we are no matter how many members of our family went to church none of us can make us spiritually alive on our own the solution to the problem of spiritual death isn't good works the solution needs to be a miracle that's how big the mess is we're spiritually dead and so what do we need we need to be made alive and this this is why Christianity provides the only answer to the great problem that we have. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 9, where we'll go to our second point here today. It's a solution Christianity gives. Verses 4 through 9 says this, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God not a result of work so that no one may boast what is God's solution to our problem verse 5 says that you and I have been made alive in Christ God does something in our lives that you and I are powerless to do ourselves which is only God can raise the dead only God can give life where there is death 
When we were separated from God and completely helpless to bridge that gap, God has done the work, and through Jesus, we can be made alive in Him. Why did God choose to do this? To sinful humanity that has chosen to replace Him with other things. It is because God is a God of grace. Grace means that He gives us what we don't deserve. Verses 5 and verses 8 says it again and again, By grace you have been saved. God saves us even when we didn't deserve it. And when you take a step back and look at these verses as a whole, we can see that the case against us is fair. We rightly deserve the spiritual death that our actions had warranted. We deserted God. We replaced God. We deserve death for our idolatry. But what is grace? Verse 4 shares to us what grace looks like. It is these simple words. Verse 4, but God, even though we deserve death for replacing God in verses 1 through 3, God chose to save an undeserving people like us. That is great grace. We were children of wrath, it says in verse 3, but God saved us by grace. We deserve wrath. God gave us grace. We were dead in our trespasses and sin, verse 1, but God made us alive in Christ, verse 5. We replaced God and chose to follow the world, but God raised us up in the heavenly places to be seated with Christ. God did not leave us in our spiritual deadness, but God chose to give us grace. Grace that you and I did not deserve. So what is Christianity's solution to the great problem that we have? It is simply this. We are made alive by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And that is a summary of this section from verses 8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. We are not saved by doing good things, but we are saved in Jesus Christ. You see, we believe that Jesus has provided the solution that we couldn't earn or deserve ourselves. How? By taking the wrath of God for us on the cross. Do you notice that on the cross, Jesus screams out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why would Jesus say such a thing? Why would he say to the Father, Why have you forsaken me? It is because on the cross, Jesus is experiencing the wrath of God that you and I deserve. In another words, Jesus on the cross is experiencing spiritual death. He is feeling the pain and agony of what separation from God feels like. And he took that on the cross. He took the spiritual death so that you and I may be able to be made spiritually alive. Even though we chose to take God's place, even though we chose the world over God, if you believe in Jesus Christ, He takes your sins, the sins that you deserved, and He gives us in return the spiritual life that He earned and deserved by His good works and His love. Even though we chose to take God's place in our lives, God chose to take our place on the cross. What is that a picture of? That is a picture of grace. I have heard it best said by theologian John Stott, who said the nature of sin is us substituting ourselves for God, while the nature of salvation is God substituting himself for us. We were against God and put ourselves where God deserves to be, but God sacrifices himself for us and puts himself where only we deserve to be. There can only be one solution to the problem of our spiritual deadness, and that is to turn and believe in Jesus Christ and be saved. Not by our works, not by our efforts, but by grace. There is no other solution than the gift of grace that God has provided for us in Christ Jesus. If you are not a believer here, we are so thankful that you have come to join us, and this is your invitation your invitation to know that the mess that you have made by replacing God and choosing yourself over God
can be fixed, that there is a solution. And it doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how moral you are. It doesn't matter whether you grew up in church or not. All you need to do is turn and believe in what Jesus Christ has done for you. He has taken the wrath of God on the cross. He has screamed out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that you and I would never have to say those words. We would never have to know what it's like to be forsaken and feel the wrath of God. You and I can be saved, not by our efforts, but by grace, by God choosing to be in our place. And so we hope and pray that if you're not a believer here today, that you would believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ here today. If you are a believer here today, what should our response be? Our response should simply be that you and I should worship God out of gratitude and joy and thanksgiving for that fact that Jesus Christ paid our debt on the cross. He paid what we owed to God. We deserved wrath because of our idolatry, and Jesus paid all of it. What should our response be to that? We should worship God. One of the ways I've seen this illustrated was by a, a pastor, and he said that imagine for yourself that you come home one day and you find your friend sitting at your kitchen table. And your kitchen table, he's sitting there, and he has all of these, your envelopes open. And before you could ask, hey, what are you doing? He goes and explains himself and says, oh, you know, hey, good to see you. By the way, I've just uh, decided to take care of all of your bills. So I paid them. So that's why I opened all of these envelopes that are on your kitchen table. Now, what should your response be? Well, your response should be dictated by how much your friend had paid your debt for you. If it was just simple utilities and your internet bill and your phone bill, even if you did overage of data and you're gonna get caught, right? You'd be pretty grateful, right? It was 100, 150, $200 to say, hey, man, that was really cool of you to do. Hey, thanks, I really appreciate that. Hey, dinner's on me. I appreciate what you did. But imagine for yourself that contained within those letters was a great insurmountable debt, a debt that would lead you to jail, a debt that would crush you and your family financially, a debt that would put you at the very bottom of society with no escape and no hope of ever getting out in your lifetime. If that debt was that big and your friend said, with one sweep of a phone app or with one check that I've mailed out, I have completely paid off all of your debt, how would you respond to a friend that did that? It wouldn't simply just be, hey, thanks, I appreciate it. Or, hey, thanks, I'll go ahead and buy you dinner. If I would imagine myself being in that position, I would fall on my knees, weep, crying, and say, thank you, thank you, thank you, over and over again. Now, if we were to expand that and think about that Jesus took the wrath of God for us, that what our sins deserved was the very wrath of God. If it meant that Jesus paid that, how thankful should our lives be? What would be appropriate to do for someone that paid your debt just like that? May our lives model after the grace and mercy that Christ has paid for us. And my, may our lives not be formed and shaped by our circumstances that we're going through right now, but shaped out of gratitude and joy and thanksgiving for what Christ has paid for us on the cross. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the message of grace that we heard here today. Unleashed in Ephesians 2, 1 through 9 are some of the most treasured verses in the Bible. Father, we see how dark our hearts really were Father, we have chosen to exchange you for other things. And yet, God, in your mercy, by your grace, you have come and saved us. You have reversed all of our wrong actions and has made us a place in your family. We thank you for Jesus who paid the price of our wrath for us on the cross. And God, we pray that in gratitude and joy, 
we may live a life of thanksgiving, hope, and peace because Jesus has paid our ransom. He has paid our debt on the cross. Thank you, Father. And for any of us that do not know you, I pray that they would be led to believe in Jesus today. We thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. And seventh graders, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys in our Zoom chat. Have a great rest of the week and God bless. I was an orphan lost at the fall Running away when I'd hear you call Father, you worked your will I had no righteousness of my own I had no right to drown in your throne But Father, you loved me still and in love before where you lay the world's foundation You predestined to adopt me as your own You have raised me up so high above my station I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone you left your home to seek out the lost You knew the great and terrible cost Jesus, your face was set And I worked my fingers down to the bone Nothing I did could ever atone But Jesus, you paid my debt and by your blood I have redemption and salvation Lord, you die that I might reap what you have sown And you rose that I might be a new creation I am born again by grace and grace alone I was in darkness all of my life I never knew the day from the night But Spirit, you made me see I swore I knew the way on my own A head full of rocks, a heart made of stone But Spirit, you moved in me and at your touch my sleeping spirit was awakened And on my darkened heart the light of Christ has shone I called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken Heaven said it's in by grace and grace alone so I'll stand in faith by grace and grace alone I will run the race by grace and grace alone And I will slay my sin by grace, grace alone And I will reach the end by grace and grace alone oh.